the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, we're going to be speaking to Jade Paveley, who is currently a regular driver for Mazda Motors UK and is now competing independently in a Sabru rally car in the Motorsports News Championships for 2015 and 2015. Hi, Jade. How are you? Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I'm good, thank you. Oh, no, it's wonderful to have you on here. So we're going to be talking all about racing and motor cars and motorsports, and it's going to be absolutely fascinating because I know nothing about this area. So I'm really excited about some learning, some new knowledge. But before we kick off, Jade, if you could just introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit more about you. Yeah, um, so I'm Jade. Um, I'm 22. I compete for Mazda Motors UK, and I do race for them on a regular basis and I also rally as well I started competing in motorsport when I was 15 to be honest I've always been around cars and motorsport I drove my first car when I was seven around the family farm and I kind of got thrown into different things like driving big trucks and motorbikes and everything really which has really helped me now because I don't feel like many things phase me now because I had all those experiences when I was a lot younger and it seemed normal so in some ways it's really given me an advantage and I can just get on with things now. I started racing karts when I was 15 and it was literally the weekend of my 15th birthday and myself and my brother uh, started and um, my brother stopped because he didn't really like it but I loved it so I've continued ever since um, and I moved from carts to race cars when I was 17. So let's just go back a bit you know so you're on the farm you're seven years old and you're driving your first car what type of car was it was it a little mini was it a Land Rover? Yeah it was it was a Land Rover it was automatic so I was kind of cheating Um when I was younger I was quite tall for my age I've kind of stopped growing now I'm not particularly tall now but my dad used to prop load of pillows and cushions behind me so I could reach the pedals um, and luckily there's a big open space so I didn't really hit anything but it was just kind of seemed like such a fun cool thing to do I always wanted a Barbie Jeep I never got one of those and I think when you're really young like that you kind of don't really see any fear really you don't have any barriers so you just you just do it and it was really good fun <laughs> God, no, absolutely. And driving big trucks and motorcycles and everything. It sounds really fun where you were growing up. It sounds absolutely it, amazing. It was fun. It was at the time I used to hate when my dad said, come on, Jay, try this out. And I thought, oh, God, not again. But it, in hindsight, I think it was a really good thing to do. He used to make me like reverse big cars and trucks. And we were quite fortunate having the space where we could do things. And it wasn't you know, dangerous or whatever. It wouldn't ever make me do anything that was really bad. <laughs> now, I don't feel like anything's too big a deal which is great. And I just want to come back to your age. So 15, that's when you sort of started racing cars. Yes, yeah. And I know like a lot of 14, 15, it's a really, it can be a really difficult age. And those are the ages where lots of girls start dropping out of sports. They don't want to get involved with various things. They don't want to be seen to be different. They want to fit in. And doing something like racing could make you stand out. So how did you find it when you were that age? Yeah, I, I totally agree. 15 can be a really difficult age. You are finding yourself and maybe making new friendship groups and doing GCSEs and so on. I guess like any girl, it was a bit difficult doing other things, but I found the racing really gave me confidence in what I wanted to do. If I turned up on, at school on the Monday and I've had a good race and I do feel good for the rest of the week and I'll try hard at school and it was a good motivation as well. Like if I'd worked hard and got good grades at school, then dad would say, yep, that's cool. We can do that this race this weekend so it was good motivation but I didn't really see myself as standing out too much I think just because I'd always grown up in motorsport and the motor industry it didn't really phase me that I was probably one of the only girls most of the time um there was another girl who started the same weekend as me so you know we got really good friends quite quickly and we kind of supported each other um maybe some like the other girls that you've spoken to in in any sport you really have to just get on with it and be determined and you have to really have that self-belief otherwise you won't be as competitive maybe you won't do as well as if you're holding yourself back so I think it was it came quite clear at a young age at 15 that I did need to just get on with things and be confident in myself I mean it didn't always come easily and it still doesn't I still doubt myself my own ability and that's just something that I think everyone goes through at some point at the same time doing something a bit different and doing something where you had to be committed you know going around a corner if you sometimes there was there's corners around the race circuits that I used to compete at if you did lift then there was a chance you might 
crash because of the nature of the corner so you had to really believe in in what you're driving and that you could do it so I think actually it was good for me in, in some ways. You started racing carts at 15 and then 17 you changed from carts into like racing cars. Yes yeah. So I'm obviously going to have to ask you did you pass your driving test on your 17th birthday and did you pass it first time? Yeah I did you know what I did my first race the same week as my driving test it just it was one of those things you know when everything happens at once. I had my test on the Tuesday and then I had to drive up in an MX-5, in a Mazda MX-5, which my Mazda had lent me, up the M1 up to a place called Croft, and that's a race circuit. And I drove the first time legally by myself around a race circuit um, the next day on the Wednesday, which was like a test day. And then that weekend I raced. So it was a crazy week. And thank God I passed because it, it really would have been embarrassing um, to you know have the L plates on the race car or whatever. So it was quite a big week. But learning to drive wasn't the best experience for me. I kind of thought I could do it already. So me and my driving instructor didn't get on too well. But, but, but I could, passed. <laughs> but, but could you do it already, though? Or was it just like, um, I suppose you obviously could drive, but I suppose it's driving in the way that keeping your hands at 10 and 2 and looking at all the spaces. And is it very different from like the racing that you've been doing to like driving on the road? Uh, yeah, it was. It was strange to be on the road where not everyone was trying to race you. Um, I know it sounds a bit silly, but it was getting used to just driving keeping to the speed not accelerating like fast everywhere and just having people coming at you the other way because in a race circuit or rally you're always going the same direction um so if you had like another car obviously coming towards you always used to kind of freak me out a little bit but I think I just yeah I I knew how to drive that was fine it was just making sure I did everything properly and um kind of not seeing just driving to the shops or having a driving lesson as a competition or like having to prove myself it was just driving so it was kind of unwinding that mentality really so quite a crazy weekend passing your driving test heading off you know to do this race now you mentioned about racing and rallying could you just sort of explain the differences between the two yeah sure so um racing um you've you know everyone sees it on tv for the formula one or touring cars that's kind of daytime tv stuff so racing is where you compete at a race circuit there's various circuits around the uk um silverstone's probably the most well-known one in the uk for everybody so and you'll have a certain amount of people on the grid like for instance with my racing i had about 50 60 people at the same time all racing on the circuit and you have to get past the, the start finish line first to win. So you'd have laps. So if it was, say, 15 laps, you'd have to go 15 laps round and get past the finish line as, as far ahead as everyone else as, as you can. And there's different kinds of racing. I did what you call endurance racing. So my first race was a 12 hour race and the next one was a 24 hour race. And that's where you have a few drivers. So it's like a relay. You have to do your laps and then come in then swap for another driver and then they'll go out and do their their stint um and then the rallying is where you have to get from a to b as quickly as possible and they can be on race circuits actually but an actual um that instead of a lap you have a stage so a stage can be a couple of miles long it could be you know 10 miles long and you have a start line and then you get to the finish it can be around an airfield it can be around a road but one of the main differences is you have someone sitting next to you in a rally car. So they're called a navigator or a co-driver. And I've got another girl sitting next to me, actually, Sarah. And it's cool because she's one of my best friends. So we do have a good laugh. But she can also tell me if I'm breaking too early or I'm not committed enough. Um, and then I'll just tell her if she needs to tell me to do things. So that's quite cool because in a, in a rally car, it's quite a team effort, really. But racing and rallying are different. It's a bit like rugby and football. So which one do you prefer doing the most? Or did you start off doing one and then move on to the others? I still do a little bit of racing alongside the rallying. But at the moment, the rallying is kind of taken priority because I'm doing this Motorsport News Championship. And the Motorsport News Championship is actually using race circuits for the stages which is great because I've had the experience around these race circuits. And when you're driving a race car, you have a racing line that you follow around the circuit to get the fastest lap. And there's a certain technique you have to drive to get this line. Um, You have to be quite smooth 
if you've watched Formula One, a lot of people say Jensen Button drives very smoothly. Um, and it's something that you kind of get from racing. Whereas rally drivers, if you see rallying, you see them chucking the cars round and get them sliding. So luckily, because of the racing experience I've had, where I'm doing the rallying now, I can use that experience with the rally kind of knowledge I've learned. So in some ways, it's, it's really come together very well. But I hope to do some more races with Mazda um, in the, in the near, near future. So one of the things that interests me is um, is racing cars. It now to me it shouldn't matter on your gender whether or not you are a good driver or not. But I I, I I'll be inter- I'm really interested in your opinion on this because obviously there's almost this preconception that women are bad drivers because they don't have the spatial awareness or you know it's always the jokes about women and parking. You know, I joke myself that my parking is absolutely horrendous, and I've had you know other people have to park my car for me before, you know, or trying to get me out of spaces. But is that just like a preconceived notion, or, or I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I, yeah, I get asked this question quite a lot. As my day job, I work in a car dealership selling cars, so I get the general public's kind of opinion as well as like people who compete. I do think that people just through habit kind of suggest that females aren't a good a driver. I didn't think there was any issues with like people saying that at all before I started working in a car dealership. But then I started to hear these comments and I thought, that's not right. Because even females, though, you put yourself down. And I think maybe maybe it's just me and just my friends, but you tend to put yourself down. I know my mum does it as well. She'll always kind of say, oh, well, I'm not so good at this. But And I think maybe it's just something that we've just got into, just suggesting that we can't drive as well. But the amount of guys that come into my workplace and say, oh, yeah, my wife's reversed into a pillar or she's scratched my car. And you find out it was them in the end, which is quite funny. (laughs) I think you just need to have a bit more confidence really in your driving. I don't think it makes a difference at all whether you're a female or male, whether you're a good driver or not. I think it's just your personality and if you enjoy driving or if you're confident doing something, I don't think it makes a scrap of difference if you're a girl or a boy driving. Yeah. I think I think the interesting thing you mentioned is the confidence issue and yeah, the fact definitely. that I know that women, they just do put themselves down. They don't have the self, they don't necessarily have that self confidence to go out there and and to do it so racing it is very male dominated how did you find it especially you know when you were 17 heading along to these big these big rallies these big meetups were there other girls competing with you or you just sort of thrown in with all the guys you're just thrown with all the guys it's it's not a um a separated gender sport so you're all in it together um, which I think is probably a good thing, really. I didn't really find it. I've never really found it an issue being a girl in the in the male-dominated area until really I started working and getting a little bit older and listening to what people had to say in my workplace because it was just customers, really, when they came in. And like I said, you know, husbands blaming their wives on scraping their cars when it was them or um, when I was selling cars because I'm, I guess I'm young as well and female. I had to really prove a point sometimes. Um, and if I can do well in my racing and rallying and kind of prove and just give other girls kind of something just to say, well, hang on, she did it. Why can't I? That would be amazing if I could do that. I think it's really given me something to kind of focus on and push. I'm not saying that I'm ideal or a good role model by any scriptural means. I'll try my best. But if I can help in some way prove to people that why can't girls do this then I'd feel like I've I've done something you know I'd feel like I've achieved something and I really do want to push that forward really absolutely and the fact is you you, you already are this role model because you're out there and you're doing it and you're doing it really 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 well thank you Rick. thank you so much and I think I mean the other thing that is interesting is people wouldn't necessarily know that you're a girl we know <laughs> with, with the helmets and the outfit when you're all covered up and you're in a race car it you don't know who I mean I suppose you would know who's in the other cars but actually when you're racing it doesn't really matter it just matters what line you're on who can take the corner who can drive smoothly and how it all works um works together so you entered your first race what was that like for you can you try and relive that experience well I think the first kart race was probably more kind of nerve-wracking because the first kart race because when you're in a car it's outside whilst well, competing it's not an indoor one it was outside and it was tipping down with rain and there was fog and I just remember just oh my I couldn't think about it the week before I was just so nervous I still get really bad nerves now to be fair I just remember being 
on the warm-up lap thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? But it's as soon as the, the flag goes down and you go, you just kind of forget about everything. And I think that's one of the great things about having a sport or a passion. Once you're, once you're doing it, you kind of forget about whether the problems or whether you've you know, your hair looked good that day. Do you know what I mean? It's just you, you do it and you focus on what you need to do. And it's kind of escapism, really. You just uh, have to focus on the task in hand. But that first kart race really was pretty scary. And then the first race I did, because it was for a manufacturer straight away, obviously had to look after the car, make sure I didn't crash it, but still go really fast. And that's probably one of the most challenging things about racing for a team like that, because you do have to prove your your um, ability and show that you're fast and you know make the team kind of appreciate your drive because it's a very competitive sport but at the same time you have to bring the car home without crashing it because it's a real fine line when you're doing a really fast lap or a fast stage between going really fast and then chucking the car off the road and crashing so that's probably one of the biggest challenges now, one of the things that you just mentioned was about like your nerves, you know, before you go into a race is you do get very, very nervous. And even, you know, in that first race, you felt those nerves, but then, you know, once the flag went down, you're absolutely fine because you're focused. How do yeah. you cope with those nerves? Do you have any tricks up your sleeve or things that you do to, um, that you could share with us? Well, I know my nerves aren't quite as bad as some people's. I know there's one guy, he co-drives and he's sick before every rally <laughs> and he's been doing it for years, but... I don't know when when I'm sitting in the car with Sarah before a rally because uh, there's the two of us sitting in the car you can kind of feel both of our nerves together because if she's quiet I know that she's nervous whereas I just kind of jabber on and I don't want to jinx anything so I don't want to be too overconfident but then at the same time I know I have to be otherwise I won't drive as well I just kind of make sure that I've done everything that I can to be ready and prepared I make sure that i I've got all my kit ready because that's a real big thing. You've got to make sure you've got your fireproof boots and suits and your, your helmet and make sure that I've tied my hair back so it's comfortable and just make sure I know roughly what the first few corners of that stage is going to be because with um, with rallying, you don't know what's coming up because your co-driver has a map or notes and they tell you which way to go. So I have to have some picture in my mind just so I know how fast I need to go off the start line and when I need to brake and so on. When I was racing, more regularly they they teach you to visualize the lap you're about to do so you feel like you've already done it and you know what to do and um, whereas with rallying I can only do that so far because I don't know the full stage what I try and do is like watch videos of other people doing it first so I get an idea to control your nerves sometimes it does come down to preparation and being Definitely. ready and getting into your routine so whether that is you know putting on all your fireproof gear tying your hair back so you know it's comfortable getting in the car knowing everything's set up that can actually having that routine can actually help to to calm down your nerves the, the second thing i'm really interested in is and you mentioned it as well when you're you know borrowing someone else's car there's a very fine line between the risk between driving fast and the speed that you're going at how do you get that balance right that's that's the big question really it's you've got to really feel in yourself your confidence and feel what the car's doing and um, you may have felt it driving down the road you know if it's raining have you ever felt where it just skids a little bit or you feel oh that was a bit funny going around a corner and you feel that the car is doing something that you're not quite used to what you have to do in the build-up to racing and rallying is um what they call tests and that means that you go to a circuit or an open place where you can just drive and get to feel the car and change what they call the setups so you may have like changed your tire pressures or check that they're they're okay or um even adjusted your seating position they're little things that you do on a road car and then on a race or rally car that's exactly the same you need to check tire pressures are the correct tire pressures because when you're driving fast um, they have a certain compound on the tires and they get warm so that gives you grip so you've got to make sure that you know what tire pressures you're going to be running um, as best you can um, and making sure you're comfortable in the seat because if you're not comfortable then you can't concentrate or if you can't reach the pedals properly then you're never going to do a good good um, race or rally 
I, and, say, I don't know how you can even feel all that stuff. I was going to say tire pressure. I definitely haven't never checked the tire <laughs> pressure. I do adjust the seat. I was just thinking the other day, I don't think I've ever even filled the car up with petrol <laughs> for like, really? uh, yeah, for ages. It just gets filled up automatically. Well, no, it doesn't. Someone, just, um, I have a very nice person who takes it and fills up, fills up the car with petrol for me. Well, that's nice. I can't complain about that. That's, oh, yeah. that's pretty cool. <laughs> to be fair, we, I do have, mechanics and technicians that work on the car i've got a team around me so it's not not just me running around trying to do all this because to be honest i've still got a lot to learn on the mechanical side i'm, I'm trying my best to learn um but that's really just hitting the surface you can change loads on a car so in kind of answer to your previous question when you um as long as you've tested and you can feel what's right and what's wrong you can kind of just keep pushing but sometimes it really is quite on edge and you think I really hope I get around this course <laughs> um but at the same time when you've got someone next to you as well you've got to I've always got that in the back of my mind that I've got Sarah sitting next to me so it's not just my safety it's Sarah's but at it but we both do it because we love the adrenaline we know it's a bit dangerous it's just how motorsport is um it, whenever anyone gets into a car you know you've always got the risk of people around you and and yourself really absolutely i mean one of the things i was going to ask you is you know you are sat when you're rallying you've got sarah sat next to you she's your navigator yeah. and there's a the two of you in the car and there must be there's a lot of teamwork involved obviously and a lot of trust between you two because yeah. One, you're, you know, you're driving this car, you know, her life is in your hands. But equally, she's also got to communicate with you of what the corners are like and how fast or how slow you should go. How how did you build up that teamwork? How did you get that trust? I think we just, well, we met when um, we were waiting to go out um, on a stage at a rally. There was, there was a delay. So we were standing outside the car in, in a queue, basically, before you start the, the rally. And I just said, oh, how are you getting on? So I always make a point of speaking to other, to other girls. Um, and we just chatted. And then we just met up for coffee. And then we had some food. And we go out now. You know, we go out, out to Chester Clubbing or whatever. So we kind of, you form that friendship, don't you, really? And I think through friendship, you, you gain trust. and that's something I think is really important because we do see each other outside the sport and we do, you know, talk about girl stuff. We go shopping, you know, normal things really. And I think that's really where it's come from. I know that she's had other experience with other drivers as well. So um, she knows where I'm at with my driving and I know where she's at in her navigating career. So as long as we've both had experience of different cars and, and different bits in motorsport you just you kind of just do I think you know when you've got the right person I think like anything you kind of get to know your friends and what their strengths and weaknesses are and one of Sarah's things she used to do horse riding and I don't know about you but I'd find horse riding petrifying because you're not in control the horse can do anything so she is really kind of get up and go girl anyway and when I start to slide in a car or it feels a bit out of shape um, she doesn't flinch at all I think it's really helped because she, she used to do horse riding she used to have to be really calm and that's one of her real strong points that she's calm collected organized and they're really really important things I was just going to say we have a giggle in the car as well when we're competing on the stages because I have had one moment where I thought I was about to crash and because uh, I was looking behind me in the mirror to see if it was clear to see if anyone was coming and I kind of looked up too late around this corner it was really muddy and I heard her go Ah, and I start going, ah, and we kind of both scream our heads off around this corner. We made it, so it was fine. We laughed about it afterwards, but um, it has happened. <laughs> have you have you ever had like a nasty crash or anything happen? I have when I was karting, and that's probably one of the great things about moving from carts to cars because in a car you've got a ro what they call a roll cage around you, which is a big metal frame, which means if you are in a shunt or if you roll, then the car's not going to implode around you. Um, and in a cart, you're literally exposed to the elements. And um, somebody went into the back of me and it caused me to spin towards a, a tyre wall. To be honest, I can't really remember this bit very much because I got knocked out. But I fell out of the seat and hit my head on the back of the tyre wall. And apparently I bounced my head several times off this tyre wall. <laughs> but I just, I guess I didn't even realise. I just remember thinking as I slid towards the tyre wall, oh my God, this is going to really hurt. Because there was no way of stopping it whatsoever so I kind of 
I just kind of like woke up, I guess, in the seat and I was shaking. I was like, what the hell's wrong? And then I was really annoyed that because I was doing really well and I thought, God, I'm not going to let this result go. So I got the cart started again when the, the technicians pushed me, actually, which in hindsight probably wasn't a good idea. But I got started again and I finished the race. It was probably the worst I've ever driven in my life, but I finished and then I pulled up into the pits and my dad ran over like, oh, my God, are you OK? And I was like, Dad, please take me to the ambulance because I literally couldn't move. I just I think I was just a bit in shock, but I hadn't broken anything. And I was probably 16 or 17 and I was doing the the guy in the ambulance said it's a good thing you're flexible because you kind of bounced. And I was doing dancing as well at the time. So apparently that helped. It does help. And again, I suppose it also gives you almost like a frame of reference now as well about what to expect if it were to to happen but kind of yeah it's a bit at the same time you can't let it linger because if you're thinking oh my god I'm gonna crash then you'll never like push yourself I guess it happens in, in other sports as well like if you've like in a horse if you fall off or skiing or something you fall over you just got to get it back up again otherwise yeah you wouldn't do it I absolutely guess. well I mean one of the things I was um similar to racing but not similar to racing i was mountain biking down death road in bolivia and (laughs) my cousins just did that (laughs) oh it's it's possibly one of the scariest things i've ever done but the reason i mention it is when we were traveling down the guide used to shout to us look to where you want to go keep looking forward because he said you know if you because i kept sort of looking over to like my left hand side where the cliff drop was and saying oh wow that's quite a long way down and you obviously start turning your bike in that direction so I was just wondering is there something similar in racing where is it you know is it look to where you want to go because if you get into a spin I've heard a lot of people you're not meant to look at the wall are you you're meant to look at away from the wall so you don't end up crashing into it do you understand what I'm saying yeah yeah. totally yeah he was very right your instructor person yeah don't look down the side of the cliff because you'll go because you really you go where you're 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 looking you're if you're driving on the road or to say you're on a motorway or something and you look to the left you'll you'll notice your hands automatically start steering you that way um it's just something everyone does but yeah I always looked where I go you've always got to look as far ahead as possible as well just in case someone else has crashed or something you need to be prepared to stop or go around them that's quite important but also just so you know how much speed you've got to carry as well if you're not looking ahead properly and suddenly a very sharp corner comes up you've got to be very prepared to slam on the brakes and get the car where it needs to go so yeah so with endurance races you mentioned endurance races and they could be for either 12 hours or 24 hours and during a relay how does that work so you would start the race as normal just say i started so if the race starts at five o'clock you do a, a maximum stint usually it's about three hours in the races that i did if you're doing the really massively famous um, privilege kind of races like the uh, 24-hour Le Mans, that's probably the most um, prestigious 24-hour race there is, which is in France, in Le Mans. People can drive up to six hours, I think. Um, but I did a race where I think the maximum was three hours. So I'd race for three hours and then you come into the into the pits, you'd swap over drivers and then the next driver will go out and do their stint. And it's quite tactical, really, because you have different drivers with different abilities and different conditions. So you try and play it. So if someone's quite good in in the wet or driving at night time, you put them for in in those kind of stints. Um, But I that was my second race. And I did two stints. I did one from five o'clock to eight o'clock in the evening. And that was when the sun was going down. And then I did one at three in the morning till six in the morning. And the weather was horrendous. And it was really quite scary. Um, at the time I must say I I can't say that I'm a completely fearless because really that was that was quite challenging I was gonna say in keeping your concentration going because you're obviously going at big speeds here or go driving very very quickly how do you keep that concentration and that focus for that length of time do you are there any tips or tricks or how does it work it's just trying to get the improve your lap time really you're just thinking right how can go faster how can I go quicker and because the conditions usually change over that period of time, especially in the UK, you know, it's bound to rain at some point. So um, you've just got to keep thinking, right, how can I do this corner better? How can I get my foot down sooner so I can get more acceleration down? Is there any way I can make this smoother so I can go faster? And it's really just trying to keep your your focus going. Um, but when you're doing the endurance races, you have um, headphones in your helmet so you can talk back to people in the pits. So the team manager or whatever may be on the microphone. 
And before the race, they did say to me, oh, look, if you know, if you feel like you're getting tired, just just quickly say something to us and, you know, we'll chat or whatever. You don't really want to chat too much, obviously, because you do get distracted. But I remember saying, hi, uh, is anyone still awake? And I got some pretty snappy response back. I think they're all quite tired at like four in the morning. Yeah. So I just had to get on with it. It was um, it really is one of those things where you just have to keep pushing and if you really do feel like you're too tired or you can't carry on, you have to tell somebody because I don't think you ever really would fall asleep. I don't know, maybe someone has, but because your adrenaline is running and you're having to concentrate and it's kind of the fear factor really, especially at that kind of time because it was so wet and so dark. If you did make a mistake or you did end, I don't know, the rain was so bad, you couldn't really see the um, the outline of the circuit. So you had to really be on the ball. And I think it was just that fear of going off or making a mistake, especially when I was driving for Mazda at the time. You've got to really make sure you prove yourself. No, absolutely. So, I mean, I know you've only been racing for, for, for a few years, but what would be one of your highlights from that racing period? Well, I guess actually I'm going through one of the highlights at the moment because in the in the rallying kind of part because I'm ninth in the championship for the motorsport news championship and that's that's really great because there's some really competitive drivers in there and there's some really fast cars as well so I'm really really pleased with that and Sarah's also very pleased so I think um if I continue that momentum and finish the championship I really want to get in the top five that would be fantastic if I could so I think if I do that, I'll make that one of my highlights. <laughs> I guess another highlight, we were second at a, a circuit called Snetterton. And that was with Mazda. So that was a really good result. So hopefully I proved myself. But also it's not just the actual races. Mazda were really cool. And they asked me to do um, the launch video for the new MX-5. So I got to go to Barcelona in February and basically drive around a race circuit getting filmed in the nice warm weather. And that was really cool. And that went out on YouTube and got thousands and thousands of hits which is great because hopefully that'll help me get some more sponsorship it kind of builds up in your portfolio so it's not just the racing it's the stuff that you do outside it as well so that so there's a couple of things that i just want to um want to sort of dig down a little bit deeper so you're ninth in the news okay. championship at the moment which is absolutely fantastic and your goal is to finish in the top five how yeah. does, does does it work in like a season or how many races have you got left before um before it before it's over um, off the top of my head, I think it's eight or nine rounds. The ninth one is to be confirmed, so we'll see. You do have like a season, really, or a championship. So um, this one's quite unusual. It goes over the winter months and early into next year. Um, and you, you can pick and choose your championships. Um, this one just seemed attractive to me in the car because it's based mainly around race circuits, which is tarmac. And just to go a bit further into rallying, you can either have sealed surface, which is tarmac, or you can have loose surface, which is like gravel or going for the, through the forests. And my car, the Subaru Rally car, that's really suited to to tarmac, um, just because the, the suspension's a bit stiffer and it just it just works better on it. Really, I won't go into it too much because I'll bore you with the details. <laughs> but um, it's just a bit more suited, and because of my racing experience, it just kind of seemed ideal. And it's the first year they're running it in this kind of format, so. I'm pleased I kind of got on board with it because I think next year the the entries will be very, very full. And is, is there anything else that you need to be doing specifically in terms of training to get into the top five? So do you need to be uh, physically fit to, yeah. to to race the car because it, does, it, does it drain on you? How does that work? Definitely. It's, it's kind of, unless you do it, it's kind of hard to say how physically demanding racing and rallying can be i think when i was karting that was probably the most physically demanding because it's you don't have any power steering you don't have any um like assistance really um i had to train very hard and to be honest you get kind of strong through doing it anyway but with the rallying you have to be very quick with your hands and turn very quickly and it's quite a heavy car to kind of get moving um, so I train as hard as I can, um, if, if work permits. Um, well, what sort but, of training do you do? Um, core exercises and upper body strength and also legs now, cause my, to break, you have to push very hard. It's, as I said, it's quite a lot of weight to stop, um, and cardio as well. And you said earlier about concentration, the fitter you are, the better your concentration is. And if that gives me the upper hand being fitter over the other drivers, then, then I certainly will train harder. And, um, 
when I was I was part of the it's called the MSA Academy, which is the Motorsport Association Academy, and they're the governing body of the sport. And I was picked to go on their team, and we mainly focused on fitness. So I had to do a CO2 max test, and I had to do a bleep test, and also core strength tests as well um, at the Porsche Centre in Silverstone, which was a fantastic opportunity, and it really motivated me because I was one or two girls out of this group, and. Um, I really wanted to beat them, you know, the boys. So that was kind of good motivation at the time. And I've tried to carry that on now. And I know that the stronger I am, the quicker I can be generally. So I think it's really important to make sure that you've got good strength and you've got good core. Um, And as I said, it's really good for your your focus as well. So try and run as well, even though it's freezing at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) It's difficult to go out and train in weather like this. Yeah. But as I say, the motivation um, really interests me because I I love the fact that actually, you you know, you're going out into the Porsche Centre, you're one of only two girls out there and you're, you know, you're being tested for your CO2, the bleep test and your core strength and it, and you wanted to beat the boys and that was one of your motivations. What other things keeps you motivated? motivated what drives you in this sport I think as said before I didn't quite realize how much I wanted to prove a point that girls can do motorsport they can compete they can drive they can park and they can reverse I think I've always just done it because I really enjoyed it and I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it and also to make my, my family proud and you know just to say oh I've done it and you know I'd feel when I'm old that I can look back on my life and say I've achieved something since working as said in, in a car dealership I realized that not everybody's on the same wavelengths of anyone in, in motorsport because I've never had any problem being a girl everyone's been really encouraging I've just been treated like another competitor but since working in the motor industry with general public coming into the dealership and maybe one of the older guys that I sell a car to suggesting could I drive their car for them or are you sure you can park that it's kind of made me realize that it's not just um, not everyone's up to the 21st century and, and respecting women as, as they are. If I can do well and kind of get my name out there and show people that young girls, females can still be themselves and not have to change and just be themselves, but compete at a high level and do well, then maybe, as I said, it will change some other people's perceptions and give other girls the opportunity and maybe just that little bit more of the confidence to do that they want to do and, and to drive the car they want to drive or compete or just even have that confidence for driving by themselves or parking and if someone does make a comment they'll say well why not why can't I do this no absolutely and I think it does come down to like every individual doing their bit you can only do what you can do I'm just gonna, I'm just I'd love to know like you must have some good examples of you how do you respond to that sexism the fact is that you are you're out there you're racing you're rallying you, you know you've been signed by Mazda you you're doing all these you're at these you've gone to the msa academy you've you've done all these incredible things so you know you're a phenomenal phenomenal driver you're incredibly knowledgeable about cars you've been you know driving since you were seven well you must have some sort of guys looking at you like oh what does this girl know because they might look at you and, and they will judge you based on your looks based on your age and think oh you know she's a 22 year old girl what does she know about cars why is she why is she doing this how, how do you handle that there's several ways I do do it. I, I laugh usually just to say, you know, because it is ridiculous, really, um, that you can judge someone like that. Or if I'm trying to sell them a car, I'll make sure I do sell them that car and they do drive away in that and we do get the money for it for the business. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just kind of sometimes you can kind of use it as your advantage and kind of your naivety, your naivety kind of they'll feel like they are the one making the decision. But then at the end, you kind of say, well, actually, I've done this and this and this. And they go, oh, right. OK. And they realise what they're dealing with. But it it's kind of you just have to be confident and just not let that push you back. It's it's just kind of it's my armor really that I do that sometimes, and I know I've done things, so I I just have the confidence to push on. I mean, sometimes it is upsetting, it's angering, especially when it's other women. I've been on the service desk in work, and I've had a a lady say, "No, can I speak to a man, please?" And it's like, why are you doing that? We're on the same team. <laughs> When I used to work in banking, you, you get into this competitive environment. You realise that you, you, or you think, right, I need to be really ruthless here and I've got to be really tough and I've got to do things in a certain way to get ahead and to be successful. And it's only now as I've stepped away from that very ruthless 
area and started doing, you know, doing Tough Girl Challenges and doing the podcast, I've come to realize it's it's not about competition. It's more about collaboration. That's that is what's so much more important is. And I think the other thing I notice is as well is like the comparisons, how women can end up comparing themselves to other women. Well, I don't look like her or I don't drive like her or I don't do this like her or I'm, I'm not as good as her. And you can end up putting yourself down. And I've read about, you know, comparison can be like the thief of joy. And it really can because it's not about competing. It's about, you know, doing the best for you. So, yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I think sometimes, although I do think there is sometimes that competitive, competitive edge, especially if, like, for instance, in your in your banking job, then you may have needed that position. So you need to be competitive and that's just how it has to be. But yeah, I think in a team, if there is other females, you kind of, like anyone else, you'll see what the, your strengths and weaknesses are and kind of use it together to build a better team. But yeah, we do end up comparing ourselves and that's I maybe guys do it and they just don't make a big deal about it. But if um if we could take everyone as they are, then they'll be, be a lot better, I think. So what's next for you then? What's your next big challenge coming up? Um, well probably the rest of my championship, um, in the short term. In the long term, it's making sure that my career is long and successful, of course. I've got um a few options to go down um racing and rallying ultimately i would just love to do the world rally championship or more racing at a higher level i can't say too much more just in case and i don't want to jinx it as well no, absolutely. but hopefully some more you know more opportunities will come along but you really have to push for them um you can't just think about it We've, my dad actually has been the most supportive person the whole of my motorsport career I would never have got into it if it wasn't for him and he's always been really encouraging he sometimes gets a bit annoyed if I take long to get ready and he has said you know if Matthew my brother was doing it I'm sure it wouldn't take this long to get ready for a rally or whatever but he's always been really really by my side and always pushed me to do the best I can and my mum has been that great kind of um back up and she's always been very level so she's obviously really helped but I think in the long term if I can do this world rally championship that's what I aim for I'm I'm gonna aim high and you know even if you fall a little bit short at least you've tried absolutely and those are very wise words to aim high now just I'd just really be interested in this is and this might be a really general question okay why do you think it is that women haven't got into formula one yeah, I've been asked that a few times. Just generally, because I know from my dad's other jobs as well, he's worked with drivers in Formula One um, and also teams, and we just know generally people in the in the industry. It is a really, really, really hard to get things to get into. Um, you do, of course, have to have the funds. I mean, there's been drivers that have paid forty million pounds for one season of racing, and it happens. You know, it's it's a vast expense, um, and it's a very dog eat dog kind of industry. Sometimes, if there's another driver who's maybe not as good but they've got more money you know the chances are they may get the seat um it's it's very very competitive i mean physically can you just clarify clarify that so the driver's got the funds oh so if um because it's a paying sport not all the drivers are paid that's something that it's not a lot of people kind of realize so lewis hamilton he gets a lot of money alonso he gets a lot jensen button but then the new drivers that are coming into it the only way they have funds is through their sponsorship or from family money or and so on um so they may not well the likelihood is they don't get paid when they go into the team they have to kind of pay themselves through their sponsorship so if one driver is very talented but maybe not as much money and then there's another driver who's got more money to pay for the team but maybe is less talented sometimes this sounds a bit controversial but the the driver with more money and maybe less talent will get through because he has the ways and means of doing it um so it's it's really very competitive and hard in that respect but it's not always the case of course that's not always the case but there has been cases like that and also it's motorsport when you get into it and do it full time it really is a lifestyle not just like a hobby you have to commit yourself like I guess like a tennis player or a footballer you have to really commit yourself to it and it's the training it's it's mentally and physically draining like any sport I guess so as I said it's just hard for anyone to get into so for for women because there's less of them I guess statistically maybe someone just hasn't got forward but it was great that Susie Wolf did what she did and did the test and you know, she's really put herself forward. It would be great to see another female do it because 
it's so well known even if you're not into motorsport you know that there is formula one you know who Lewis Hamilton is and you know that it's it's out there and it's on prime time tv I think it's really interesting what you said about sponsorship as well. It, it, you know, it is statistically proven that women just do not get the sponsorship opportunities that men get. And I'd just be interested in, in how you find it. I mean, obviously, absolutely fantastic that Mazda is, is sponsoring you. I mean, I would love to see more women in motorsports, and especially in, in Formula One. And it's interesting you said about it's a lifestyle as well. Um, quite an expensive lifestyle to, to yes. do. <laughs> very, very expensive, yeah. It's... It, kind of touched on on sponsorship surprisingly I've actually found being a girl in a male-dominated sport has actually helped me more so I have found being a female in a male-dominated sport has kind of helped me just because it is a different story and a different take on things from usual sponsorship at the moment I think after the recession is is you know gonna be always quite hard and it really is who you know and making sure you get out there we, before we head off, what top tips do you have for ladies out there who maybe aren't that confident behind a wheel? Like anything, I think just be confident in yourself and your own ability. If you're not confident, if you can do things to help your confidence, maybe try new things and um, do different things. Maybe if you're not confident in doing basic things, I don't know, like I was rubbish at parallel parking. I just practiced by myself. And then next time when I was in a bit busy situation, I, I know I could do it. It's like anything. If you practice, it makes perfect. And just to be confident in yourself and not don't let anyone put you back. I know that's easier yeah. said than done. As it, I just want to correct myself on something I said earlier about when people can be a bit downgrading. I think really don't take things to heart. You have to just pick up yourself up and laugh about it. Because if you take everything too seriously, then you get yourself in a right mess. So just to be happy and smile and grateful for what you're doing or the sport that you're doing. Absolutely. Very wise words. And I love your attitude. It's just so positive and can do and determined and focused. And I just love what you're doing. The fact that you are out there and doing it and you are being this role model for other women. Best of luck with all of the rest of your season. I hope you get into the top five. I've no doubt that you will. And the World Rally Championships, I'm sure will have your name all over it. (laughs) Jade, you've been an absolute superstar. Now you do have a website. Do you want to share your website details with us? My website's going under some construction at the moment, but I have got a Facebook racing page and Twitter. So it's just my name, Jade Paveley, and Paveley spelt P-A-V-E-L-E-Y. And it's the same with my racing page. It's Jade Paveley Racing. Fantastic. And is that, is that your Twitter handle as well, at Jade Paveley? Yes, it is, yeah. Wonderful. I will be putting all of the links to Jade's, web, Jade's website, her Twitter account, her Facebook page in the show notes, which will be available at toughgirlchallenges.com forward slash blog. If you enjoyed this episode and it's inspired you to go out, get behind a wheel, do some racing, obviously not on the road, stick to the <laughs> speed limits, because if you don't, you will get caught, as I got caught the other day and oh, ended no. up, yeah, it was actually very interesting. I ended up doing um, a speed awareness training course. And I actually learned a lot. So it's actually very, very knowledgeable. (laughs) Well, now you know. (laughs) And and now I do know. Um, Actually, just if you get caught speeding on the road, does that impact you on your rallying? Thankfully not, because I've been caught a couple of times. Just just in, you know, only one or two miles an hour over. But um, technically speaking, you don't need to have a road license to race. There's some really fast motorbike races out there that don't actually have a motorbike license on the road. So, yeah, you can get points, though, on your race license or your rally license if you, for instance, if you hit somebody off or do something while inappropriate. You're, while you're yeah. rally racing. Yeah, or if, like, you're, I don't know, like, aggressive to another driver or something, then you can get points on your, your race or rally license. I, that is really interesting. So don't get road, don't get rally rage. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, awesome. It does happen. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine it's, you know, adrenaline is flying. Jay, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing your journey and your story and just talking us through what it's like to, to be a female in the world of rally racing. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Sarah. Hi guys, thanks for listening to that episode with Jade Paveley. What an awesome woman, what an inspiration. I know absolutely nothing about the world of motorsports and motor racing, but I do find it absolutely fascinating to speak to somebody who's so deeply immersed in that world. Really, really 
great conversation so a massive thank you for jade for coming on the podcast few things to share with you now you may or may not have seen the sketch note sunday which i've started and this with is this is with massive thanks to lawrence bonimer who is this incredibly talented artistic guy who has been creating this visual representation of the podcast so what he does is he listens to the podcast and draws it out in this storyboard fashion so he started doing these for me and we've started to share them on the tough girl blog which is at toughgirlchallenges.com and also on the youtube channel as well all the links are through the blog and if you search um, tough girl challenges on youtube you'll find them they're absolutely amazing to look at so please do go and check them out we've done them for and daniel sally kettle sophie radcliffe jesse stensland and coming up next sunday is going to be with cheryl hunter who is the motivational speaker and transformational expert so we've gone right back to the beginning of the podcast and have started to create all of these awesome sketch notes so please do and go and check them out also i've got to do a few shout outs this today to the members of the Tough Girl Tribe because they have just been on an absolute roll. They have been smashing it. So massive congratulations to Nicola Batty who ran 11 miles the other day. She's after 14 miles and I know she's going to get there. And when she does, that will be the furthest she's ever run. So keep going, Nicola. You will reach that goal. Massive shout out to Hannah Shaw and her husband who completed a 28 mile coastal run while listening to the Tough Girl podcast. So awesome effort, guys. Absolutely fantastic. We also, um, we've got Sandy Harris, who's a member of the Tough Girl tribe, and she's actually off to Norway for Arctic survival training and skiing practice, as she is in training for the Ice Maidens Challenge. Now, if you're a regular listener to the Tough Girl podcast, you'll remember that I interviewed Nat Taylor and Nick Weatherill, who are the two British army doctors who are arranging the all-female team to head out over to Antarctica to do this challenge so if you want to know more about the Ice Maidens Challenge go back and listen to those episodes both women are absolutely awesome they're involved in the 3366 ultra ultra marathon they've also done adventure running and Ironman loads of top tips and loads loads of great advice I've also connected with a fellow female MDS runner so Sally Orange is going to be out there in the desert walking with the wound, wounded and helping to raise money for that awesome charity so I've got my first tent mate which is pretty cool but in terms of my training training is going okay but it's a really difficult balance which I'm trying to get right at the moment to not overtraining and to making sure that I get the rest and the recovery that I need. I'm averaging about 70 miles a week in training at the moment and it's only going to increase over the next two or three weeks as it as I really sort of Um, increase the mileage but I'm starting to get quite tired I'm not sleeping again so I'm really struggling with pulling back because I don't know about you guys but I just love I just love being outside I love being fit I love being active and I really do love pushing myself but I know it's starting to harm my body as I'm starting to get the similar signs that I'm getting fatigued and tired and my adrenal glands are getting affected so I know I need to pull back but it's almost like I need to give my permission to myself to say Sarah rest you're going to be okay but then psychologically you start thinking have I done enough mileage have I done enough training to physically get my body around the MDS and I sort of know in my head it's more of a mental challenge than a physical one but equally you've still got to have put in the mileage you've still got to have had that time on your feet so that's my big struggle at the moment I don't know if any of you guys are struggling with that Um, and everyone keeps saying to me you know, reduce your training, reduce your training. So I have started to, if you want to see um, the mileage that I'm doing and what my training schedule looks like, then do go check out the Tough Girl Challenge uh, blog every week. So every Monday I put up what I am, what my mileage is for that week and what I'm going to be doing. So this week it's going to be 15 miles on Tuesday, five miles, very easy on Wednesday, 10 miles on Thursday, rest day Friday four hours running on the Saturday and a planned six and a half hour walk on the Sunday. So there's a lot of time on my feet on there. So I may end up pulling back just a little bit. But 
Just to say a massive thank you to everybody who has been listening to the Tough Girl podcast. We have now had over 24,000 downloads, which is awesome. So getting very, very close to 25,000. So please keep listening. Please keep subscribing. Please keep writing reviews. And please tell, just tell one friend about it. Tell one friend about an episode that has inspired you and get them to download it, get them to listen to it. And they will not be disappointed. Really looking forward to speaking to you all next Tuesday. Have a fantastic week. And if you want to send me a tweet and let me know what you're up to, that would be awesome. I'm still over in Australia, but my Twitter handle is at underscore tough underscore girl, all in capitals. Have a smashing week, everybody. And I'll speak to you next Tuesday. Bye.